It's shocking to me, quite frankly, that I have seen language like this in contracts, but it's out there and it's so vague. It just needs to be completely deleted in my view. Welcome to Talk To Me About a and &E, a podcast series focused on risk management for architects and engineers. Host Dan Bulow, Managing Director of Willis a and &E, will engage experts across the a and &E spectrum on topics ranging from contract details to the broadest trends impacting design professionals in North America. Hello and welcome to talk to me about a and &E. I'm Dan Bulow, Managing Director of WTW a and &E, and this is part two of my discussion on the topic of the standard of care with my special guest, Colleen Palmer, Risk Manager for Beasley's a and &E program, and Lou Gale, General Counsel for the Chicago-based architecture firm SCB. In part one, we led off with a discussion on the first questions asked when a design professional is accused of negligence, which is, what was the applicable standard of care and was it met? We also discussed the role and responsibility of the design professional in managing client expectations and the potentially uninsurable risks design firms can be exposed to when assuming contractual liability over and above the standard of care. In part two, we pick up where I left off in my discussion with Colleen and Lou as we review some examples of where contract language can elevate the standard of care and how best to negotiate this language out of design professional agreements. So I've got some examples here that I want to run through how now that we've kind of set the stage, if you will, about the standard of care and, and, the, and the wording here uh, in the policies. So as we know, owner drafted agreements or modified standard agreements are often chuck full of uninsurable language. And we make the argument that's in nobody's best interest, but blame it on the lawyers or whoever you want, but it happens, right? And I know you both see it all the time. And so I'd like to review some examples of where contract language can elevate the standard of care and get your thoughts, both of your thoughts on why this language is problematic and what you might do, what a firm might do, a design professional, to uh, modify that language or negotiate that language when they're going through these agreements uh, with their prospective clients. So let's begin uh, with the oldies but goodies, as Colleen likes to say, and on some of these, and this is the, the superlatives, right? And here you have the best to the highest, first class, first rate, world class, in accordance with client standards, fit for purpose, intended, most sound. And so, Colleen, I want to start with you on that. I mean, hey, let me turn this around. I'm the owner. I'm hiring you as a as an architect, Lou. Your group, you're the you're the best out there. Why can't I reasonably expect you would be? You know, wouldn't you be the best? What's unreasonable for me to have that language in there? So, yeah. Colleen, Lou, talk to us about that. I mean, from my perspective, it goes back to what design professionals are doing versus what general contractors are doing. Design professionals are akin to, as you mentioned earlier, healthcare professionals, um, accountants, attorneys. They aren't expected to be perfect. You're not so judged by a plus standard. You're kind of judged by the curve. You're judged by a C standard. So saying you're the best, that it's going to be uh, complete or first class, first rate, you don't really know what those are, but you know that it's not the C standard. You know that it's somewhat above that, and therefore it makes it unacceptable and problematic for a design professional that's expected to provide reasonable services, but not perfect services. I would jump in and also add, it becomes then a question of the eye of the beholder, right? You, the client, are saying, well, that's not what I wanted, and it wasn't the best. And, and you're left trying to say, well, what was I supposed to do? Like, this is what my peers would have done. This is the performance level you would have gotten had you hired any 10 other architects. Um, and so I'm now left trying to satisfy an 
unsatisfying, you know, standard. And it just leaves, you know, leaves no one happy uh, at the end of the day. Sam, you see this particularly troubling language saying that perform to the client's satisfaction. And now we're completely subjective. We don't know right. that client could be 98% happy with what you did and upset about one or two little things. Well, that's not complete satisfaction. They're not satisfied. So therefore, according to that contract language, you have not met the standard of care according to how it was defined in your contract. Right. It's arbitrary, yeah. nebulous, right? Bottom line is that legal precedent out there, isn't there, where this language has been a real issue for design professionals because, as you mentioned earlier, determining did you meet the standard of care, it often comes down to a battle of experts. And if you have in there the highest, they could very well come in and find somebody, and they will, that'll say, you know, they did okay, but they weren't the highest. This wasn't the best. And so back to, you know, this uh, superlative that does have bad legal precedent. So that's an important conversation to have. We want to strike that. You mentioned earlier, too, about uh, the C standard, and I like that, too, uh, Colleen. And, and, you know, I've, I brought this up, too, in the past, and it's it's sometimes hard to, you know, stand that because if I, you know, was in your marketing department and you wouldn't want me to be in a design firm's marketing department because I'm, you know, risk averse, I see it, but I would write something like, you know, hey, we're ABC architects, we're damn mediocre, right? We just want to be right down the middle there. We don't want to, you know, but to that point, you better be reading your brochures, your marketing materials, your websites and everything else when it comes to the standard care and ask yourself, you know, is there language in here, in addition to our contracts, is there language in here that's over and above what we really should be uh, declaring here, right? Uh, totally. And I think that design professionals obviously want to put their best foot forward, and you shouldn't be putting your best foot forward in your marketing materials. I think a way to combat the potential of elevating your standard of care and your marketing materials is not to say things like, we provide 100% satisfaction to our clients on you know, office buildings, but to say, over the last decade, we have completed 520 office projects, and, or whatever the number is. And that right. doesn't say we were perfect, but it does give an indication that you've been doing this a while, you've done this number of projects, and it's not saying that you are best in the world, but it does give an indication to a reader about your experience. Good points. So this next one is on uh, further instruments. And uh, the parties agree to execute and deliver any instruments in writing necessary to carry out any agreement, term, condition, or assurance in this agreement whenever the occasion shall arise and request for such instrument shall be made. So, Colleen, you gave me a few of these examples here, and this was one of them. So I'd like you to lead off again and uh, uh, what's wrong with this or what's the concern? Sign. This is essentially a guarantee statement saying that at any point the client can contact you and say, I want you to certify or guarantee or warranty or provide any kind of instrument that the client thinks they need to guarantee the success of the project. And this is just so unbelievably vague that you can't agree to this because you have really no idea what they may ask for from you. So it's just shocking to me, quite frankly, that I have seen language like this in contracts, but it's out there and, and it's so vague, it just needs to be completely deleted in my view. It, it touches on these, as we brought this up before in, in contract discussions around red flag words, right? Where you'll see these, uh, you know, again, you named them off, the warranty, guarantee, certify, and then you get into these overly broad any and all real issue and, and firms need to be aware of that. And in the context, you know, words are important. And we're now we're talking about contract formation. It's very important. Do you have anything to add to this? 
I, I do, and and you've you've really touched on it. It's that it's that word any in here, and it it creates yeah. a circumstance in which, since we're talking about the standard of care, that a client can hand you a document and say, "Well, you promise to sign any document, and if that document says something in it that elevates the standard of care, well, guess what? <laughs> you've already promised ahead of time you'd sign that document." And so, uh, not only is there standard of care issues, but I I tend to also put on you know my lawyer hat and. And I think, well, wait a minute, I'm not going to sign a contract that says I'm going to agree to something else without having ever seen it. Like yeah. this is this is a bit much. You're asking me to just sign off on anything and everything that might show, you know, might end up, uh, you know, in front of us. We just can't agree in advance to do that. We're happy to work with you. We're happy to consider what you need. We understand there are going to be documents related to perhaps the financing of the of the project, or perhaps there's a some kind of lien waiver or something you may have to ask us to, to execute. That's all great. Send it to us. We will review, but I'm not agreeing ahead of time <laughs> to sign whatever you, you stick under our nose. In some of these situations, it may not necessarily be a black and white insurability issue, but you may be buying a performance-based exposure or taking on more risk than you really you reasonably should, right? And you need to be, you know, because again, you you have a sizable deductible. Uh, you you want to you know be very uh, careful with what you're going to be committing to, you know, with these words here. All right, so. We had further instruments. This next one is further assurances. Uh, the parties hereto hereby agree to do such further acts and things and to execute and deliver such additional assurances as either may at any time reasonably request in order to better assure and confirm unto each party their respective rights, powers, and remedies conferred here under. Wow, that's like uh, Shakespearean <laughs> almost. But uh, what, what, talk to us about this, Kali. Yeah, and this goes hand in hand, with the, kind of the same rationale as the prior one talking about further instruments. We've got the, the very broad, you know, any further acts. And I think people can be lulled into this sense of security with a lot of onerous contract provision when they're mutually drafted. So clients will say, hey, Indemnity is a great example, but we'll use this one. Hey, design professional, you don't need to worry about this because it's mutual. Well, we're going to do the same thing. But the fact of the matter is, uh, it's nine times out of 10, the client going to be requesting the professional to do these, going to do acts or things or sign any of these documents. So that argument really falls flat because these really are drafted in favor of the client, even though they are mutual. So this one, again, it's another thing where you don't have any idea what may be asked of you, but you're agreeing, like Lou said, you're agreeing ahead of time that you're going to do whatever the client asks. You ever see this one, Lou? Uh, I do. I do see it from, from time to time. And, and just as Colleen recommended with the other, you know, the previous one, the further instruments, you, you have to try to remove this in full. Um, because you just leaves, leaves yourself open to all kinds of extra commitments that you're going to have to make with respect to the project. And you may not even have necessarily included anything like this in your scope. You know, you're now being asked to go beyond what's, you know, what's expected of you. And when you do that, uh, you know, you're expanding, you're also expanding the areas where your standard of care is going to apply. Uh, so it's, it's just, it's too much risk. And I think clients don't really gain much from having this in there it, it it puts it puts parties at odds as opposed to what you know a good contract does which is it's covering things that are likely to arise and that you're going to need to address and it's also uh you know a good contract is also just getting everything in on paper that folks are agreeing to you don't want to be in a circumstance in which you're promising to do extra work and then now your standard of care is going to apply to that extra work and the client has these expectations of what you're going to do uh after the fact after they come to you and say you know we expect you to to do other things to to satisfy our expectations you want it all in writing you want to be clear as to who's doing what and and when they're doing it as opposed to these more vague like you're going to come back and and make these additional you know additional promises to us and therefore you'll be held 
held to them. You know, if you read this wording, you know, it, it definitely was drafted by an attorney. Oh, okay, this is not some owner made this up. And so, and that's a concern I think also, or something certainly to be aware of is that an owner may not know exactly what's in their agreement or, you know, their their attorney drafted it in such a way. And if hopefully you have that opportunity to, to connect directly with that prospective client and explain to them why this wording isn't in anyone's interest or, what, you know, why it's confusing or why it potentially, you know, is an insurability issue. Hopefully, again, you connect there and they, they're agreeable to that or helping, you know, or open to addressing that, I would think is, but the, you making the effort to point that out and being able to articulate, you know, what the issues are is, is important. And I'll add one of the things I've found successful. Now, I'm, I'm an attorney, right? So I will talk to another attorney and then we will get into this very legalistic language. I have right. tried to encourage the project architects and folks on the business side to have a business to business discussion about this language because it it allows it to become more normal language as opposed to being overly drafted by lawyers and you can perhaps reach a consensus that way as opposed to having two lawyers kind of duke it out very similar to the potential battle of the experts between two arguing over what's the standard of care just get your business people in the room and say look you guys try to discuss this and see if you can come to some accommodation without the lawyers battling over all this lengthy you know lengthy legalese all right, so this next one is standard of care and, and so here's the wording on this one. Professional shall exercise generally accepted professional standard of care and shall strictly comply with any and all applicable laws, codes, regulations, ordinances in effect at the time of performances of services. There you go, kind of like we were talking about, here it is. Here's that uh, uh, any and all, the dreaded and right? Yeah, that's exactly right. And this is one that if you're reading your contract quickly, you may miss it because you start to read it and you see, oh yeah, it's referencing an appropriate standard of care language and you kind of gloss over the rest. But the problem is the word and. And this is where I like to stress that every word in a contract does have meaning and it has impact. Now, if you were to take this provision and say, you're going to comply with the standard of care and comma subject to the foregoing standard of care, you'll endeavor to comply with codes. That would be appropriate and acceptable because it's tying that obligation back to the standard of care. But when a contract simply says you're going to comply with the standard of care and you're going to do all these other things, that has the effect of arguably inappropriately elevating the standard of care because it's an addition to, it's an and, it's not a tie back to the standard of care. And that's where the problem lies. Good points. So Lou, uh, you added some additional ones here. These again are, uh, let me rattle some of these off that I know are near and dear to your heart here. Meet budget. So, right. I mean, meet budget means meet budget. If, if there's contractual language that says the architect is going to produce a design that meets the budget, there are a couple of problems. One we've kind of already touched upon, which is you're essentially making a guarantee, right? You do a design and then it doesn't meet budget. Well, you've breached the, you know, you've breached your promise to us, which arguably is beyond the standard of care because I'm not a contractor. I don't do pricing. And of course, inflation can change pricing. All I'm doing is exercising my judgment on a design that's going to be consistent with the, the client's budget. And I may not, you know, I can't guarantee that that happens. Um, and second of all, I've, I've kind of just touched on it, right? I can't control construction costs. I can't control what happens once, you know, once the project rolls out and we do our design. We can use our you know, we can use the ordinary care that, you know, other architects would do, but I cannot guarantee that you will meet your budget because it is it is a lot of things out of my control. And and this is so important because this is where some of the big dollars are spent, aren't they, on these claims? You know, when we get tied into economic loss uh, issues, delayed damages and so forth. And, uh, you know, we talked about words are important. Another word that you might see put in the contract is estimate, right? You could provide an estimate where we would, 
prefer opinion of probable cost, right? I mean, again, you know, talking through what, what your intent is in here. When it comes to design build, this is a real issue where the design build, where the consultant gets tied into being responsible somehow for the the budget, if you will, on an incomplete set of drawings. But it's a problem with both architects and engineers and all delivery methods on, on this. Colin, anything to add to that? Well, I just reinforce and echo what you both have said. I mean, it's Certainly, if we look back, no one could have predicted a pandemic where construction costs and of materials would have, you know, triple, quadruple the price that they were prior to. So it's just way beyond the design professional's ability and obligation. Okay, Lou, here's the next one on here. Time is of the essence. It seems like they must teach this in law school to everybody, right? Day one. Right. So this one, I, I, I really love talking about this because time is of the essence is what lawyers like to describe as a term of art. It has specific meaning. These words, when used in that phrase, mean that time is a material term of a contract. It is it is incredibly important. Um, and it means if you're a day late, that's a breach of the contract. Whatever time frame is spelled out in the contract, you have to meet it exactly. Otherwise, that's a breach of the contract. And of course, that's very different from a standard of care. If we're required to respond to submittals within five days in the contract and time is of the essence, then every submittal that is later than five days is a breach of the contract. But of course, some submittals are hundreds of pages. Again, I was a structural engineer. You'd get a giant roll of structural steel drawings that would have to be reviewed. You'd have to go through page by page, sheet by sheet. You couldn't necessarily get it done in five. You couldn't necessarily get it done in a week. It would it would depend on you know how, how much care was needed to go through that. But if you have a contract that says time is of the essence and you have to do it within five days, well, now those two things conflict and you're potentially in my opinion, you know, raising your standard of care and at, at maybe at best, you've now got an uninsured contractual obligation. Um, and so it, it is it is an incredible, uh, incredibly important term that you have to try to uh, either get stricken or softened and tied to the standard of care. Again, we talked earlier about, you know, the standard of care of a design professional is closer aligned to a doctor and a lawyer. You know, does it make sense to uh, hold a doctor to a time is of the essence when they're doing a procedure or something? You know, there's, there's that analogy as well. Absolutely try to delete this provision. And I see it most of the time, I would say, in contracts. And what I like to do is strike it completely. But if you can't strike it, you certainly want to soften it, as Lou suggests. And the one way to do that is to say that the parties understand that the professional's performance must be governed by sound professional practices. And therefore, the professional shall perform only as expeditiously as is consistent with the generally accepted standard of care. And I think that that does provide some clarification. Now, ideally, you want that kind of language and you want that phrase, time is of the essence, to be deleted. Um, but you absolutely do not want to just leave that time is of the essence statement just bare in your contract. So the next one here, coordination. That's another one of my favorites because that becomes a, a catch-all in which any error or omission or a uh, problem that has arisen on the project that is somehow related to your services becomes your fault and your responsibility because you were supposed to quote coordinate uh, and so you you run the risk of raising your standard of care by promising to coordinate say all the owner's consultants as well including your own consultants and then if there's some disconnect or miss in terms of you know different elements that conflict on the project, now the question becomes, well, did you fulfill your coordination obligation by pointing out to the client's consultant, look, there's an issue, we've got to clear it up. And then who's supposed to be the person that changes their drawings? Is it you or is it is it the consultant? Or are you both supposed to you know, change your drawings and change your specs and meet to, to do it? So it does become uh, an issue that can elevate the standard of care as well. So you need to you need to have a definition of coordination at best um, that kind of fleshes out 
who's responsible for what and in, in what way to the extent you can. Um, I do unfortunately think you're not going to be able to remove coordination. That That is a, a service that architects and other, other design professionals provide. It's just who's doing what and when and making sure you're not being uh, asked to go beyond the standard of care. That's a good point. Define that, yep. what that term is. Okay. So good discussion around some specific examples with words and phrases uh, specific to uh, language that can elevate the standard of care. Um, I want to switch gears a little bit in that uh, talk about kind of where this is going in the future, if you will. And so uh, when we did our biannual Willis a &E survey of 17 professional liability carriers in the industry, and Colleen and her group uh, helped a lot with this, we asked the question, do you feel the standard of care is evolving? So the carriers would answer this and we put it in this report that we've released and it's available to everybody to check out. But here's some specific responses to that question. And uh, the first one is yes, it is evolving. We see it showing up and evolving in two ways. First, the standard itself is assuming more implicit scope, such as addressing climate factors. Second, Design professionals are taking on broadening scopes such as safety issues. Of course, when they take on more scope, they also take on the obligation to perform it in accordance with the standard of care, even if the scope is non-traditional. And so I just want to, again, ask, kind of get any input, any thoughts on this that you have. I think these are some interesting responses to this. I've got a couple more, but I uh, just want to see if either of you had a uh, a thought or a response to that. Yeah, I have a comment for sure. The standard of care has evolved. It will continue to evolve. And it really should evolve as we as a society change, as our technology changes and improves, as the world changes, so too does the standard of care. When it, here's a kind of an easy example. Years ago, of course, asbestos was used pretty regularly in building and it was a great material it's strong it has a, a lot of um, wonderful properties but now of course using asbestos is prohibited because of the deleterious health impacts of it so you know the standard of care back in the 30s 40s 50s was to use it now if someone specified asbestos <laughs> it would be an automatic they breach the standard of care so as climate changes as technology changes as ai comes into play the standard of care will necessarily evolve and it by rights should evolve i couldn't agree more with what colleen said it is a it is just a standard that uh that can change over time and just like dan you pointed out uh, a different definition. I think it was the EJCDC has a definition for the standard of care. Well, the AIA has a definition. If you took those side by side, you'd see that they're slightly different. Um, and so over time, uh, you know, these definitions will, will evolve and change uh, in order to address the very, you know, the things that Colleen pointed out as the, um, you know, as the industry changes. But one thing I want to stress is that while the standard changes, the definition that you're judged by what your peers are doing at the same time under the same circumstances, that core remains the same. So while you and your peers may modify what you do as the standard changes, the, the concept of being judged by what your peers are doing under similar circumstances, that remains the same. And arguably, you know, professional liability insurance coverage will also evolve to, to cover that evolving standard of care. And, you know, you mentioned uh, climate change and so did they in this. And, you know, the, the, there's a lot to talk about there when it comes to climate issues and, and so forth. But I think that uh, one important concept is in your contract is around informed consent. The concern, again, is where a client may be able to opt for the less resilient, less expensive option and, and then hold you accountable in the event that it fails in the future because of, you know, the climate issues have, you know, are, the codes have, have not kept up with the realities of where the climate change is. So this concept of informed consent to me is an important one as well uh, when it comes to discussion around, you know, the you know again, standard of care, but also 
uh, you're, you're illustrating something in your contract I think is important. Uh, here's another one from the survey. Yes, I think design firms more than ever have to document their services and communication more and they have to stay apprised during the construction phase without assuming unwanted supervisory liability, a tough balance. Thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think that that is becoming in the age of email, text messages, Teams chats, videos of the construction site, um, the, the notion that as a design professional, you're going to be able to say, well, I have no you know, obligation for inspection. And therefore, if there was something on the site occurring, I, I have no responsibility for that. I, I think that it's, it's I, I don't want it to shift this direction, but given the volume of data, it's, it's difficult to then take a position that I, as a design professional, you know, didn't have an obligation to raise my hand or, or to say anything in the context of this, you know, this information. Because uh, I used to have, we still have a rule with respect to photographs of try not to take anything between three feet and 30 feet. That's kind of the goal. Either you want to be right up close next to the thing you're photographing or so far away, you've just got some general uh, photographs because you don't want to be in a position where someone can say, here's a picture, right? I know you were trying to take a picture of that wall, but by the way, you can see in the corner very clearly that issue with the duct. You didn't say anything about, but here it is in your picture. You didn't document it in your field report, right? Well, now multiply that by a thousand, given all of the information that, that we've got and how ubiquitous the sharing of that information is. You're going to be not only, your architects aren't going to be copied on, uh, this documentation, they're going to be involved in it. Um, and so how do we manage the, you know, the standard of care in that context, I think is going to be an, an emerging issue for, for the design professional. Excellent. So that wraps up our conversation on the standard of care here. Uh, I want to ask uh, Colleen and Lou, if you have any parting uh, comments, words of wisdom on this topic for us before we depart. Colleen? I think I would say for parting comments that obviously you want to ensure as a threshold that standard of care is appropriately addressed in your contract. You don't want to go into a project already agreeing to problematic standard of care language. And hand in hand with that, keep in mind that the contract negotiation is a great opportunity for you to understand what the client expects of you. If your contract has elevated standard of care language and you discuss that with the client and they say, oh yeah, that's not a typo. We really do expect that you're gonna have no errors or omissions. Then you know from the outset, wow, this client doesn't understand or doesn't want to accept the fact that as a design professional, we will not perform perfectly. And then, you will need to make further decisions about whether to take the project, whether to work with this client, et cetera. But as a threshold matter, you want to understand what the client expects of you and make sure that what's in your contract is appropriate for you. Good point. Having that definition of the standard of care in your agreement is important. And uh, we know that every owner drafted agreement is not necessarily going to volunteer that clause, are they? That would be something we'd want to add. You know, I think that's where it's important to have a checklist if you're looking at contracts where you're looking for those important clauses. Uh, when you have an owner drafted agreement, certain clauses are not going to be there, perhaps, that you would want. The, the hazardous material clause is one I always come up with. It, it belongs in every one, but an owner drafted agreement, it might not be in there. So that would be another good example. That's a, that's a great point, Colleen. Lou. So I would say that it's, it's client selection with the context of the standard of care that's important to also keep in mind, right? When you're having, as Colleen pointed out, and we've talked about many times, if you're having these conversations with the client, you know, if there's this misalignment with respect to the standard of care and the client, it, it may be time to think about not working with that client because if their expectations are beyond what you can meet and they're not even willing to agree to, 
you know, change it in the contract. Or let's say they are willing to agree to change it in the contract, but there's sort of a wink and a nod, like, oh, yeah, yeah, we'll change the language. You know, now, again, it's it's that client expectation because that's, you know, that's the source of claims. That's the source of issues when you're not meeting their expectations. And I've had plenty of contracts with plenty of good standard of care language. But if that expectation isn't met, you know, it, it can lead you down a very difficult path with respect to um, resolving any issues that arise on the project. Excellent closing points. Well, this has been fun. I want to thank my special guest, Colleen Palmer, risk manager for Beasley and Lou Gale, general counsel for the Chicago architecture firms, SCB. Thanks again for joining us for another episode of Talk to Me About A&E. For a full listing of all of our Talk to Me About A&E podcasts, as well as our Willis a and webinars, on-demand education programs, and technical briefs, check out our education center located on our website at www.wtwae.com. And again, Lou, Colleen, thank you. Thank you for having me. Yes, thanks for having me. Um, it, was, it was fun. Well, thanks, everybody. Talk to you soon. Take care. Thank you for joining us for this WTW podcast featuring the latest thinking on the intersection of people, capital, and risk. For more information on Willis A&E and our educational programs, visit willisae.com. WTW hopes you found the general information provided in this podcast informative and helpful. The information contained herein is not intended to constitute legal or other professional advice and should not be relied upon in lieu of consultation with your own legal advisors. In the event you would like more information regarding your insurance coverage, please do not hesitate to reach out to us. In North America, WTW offers insurance products through licensed entities, including Willis Towers Watson Northeast Incorporated in the United States and Willis Canada Incorporated in Canada. <laughs>